Today, we're going to be talking about health, nutrition, and diet with cancer rates and illness and disease skyrocketing like never before. This is a topic that is super important. Welcome to Thriving Launch with Louise Congdon and Kamala Chambers, the show for heart-centered entrepreneurs who want it all. Five days a week, we bring you different segments to inspire you to live a life of freedom. We interview the leading experts in the field of business, health, and love. Be sure to check out Training Tuesdays, where we give you a clear action plan to grow your own business. Maybe you can relate to this. When I was a full-time coach, keep repeating the same things to people over and over and over again. And it got to be kind of draining and I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing anymore. So what I decided to do was record the things that I had to tell clients over and over and over again. And then I packaged those recordings together and sold them as an online course. If you're interested in creating and selling your own online course, head over to thrivinglaunch.com and I have a free training training for you on how to create and make passive income through your own online course. To talk to us about health, I've brought on Dr. Joel Furman, author of the famous book, Eat to Live. You've probably seen it, heard of it, seen it on bookshelves. I highly recommend it. Welcome to the show, Dr. Joel Furman. It's great to have you here today. Great to be here. Looking forward to it. Well, I am really excited about this topic because you have your book, Disease Proof Your Child. I mean, that title alone is amazing because it really sets kids up to be healthy and build healthy building blocks for a life full of living disease proof. So I'm really curious what you would have to say about how do we even begin to raise our kids in a healthy way? Well, that's it's a complicated question because right now we have the highest heart attack and cancer rates in the world in this country. In other words, we have about 40% of Americans dying of heart attacks and strokes and about 30, over 30% dying of cancers added together. The point is, is that the way the adults are eating is like committing suicide with a knife and fork. So right now we have a diet that I always joke around. I say the diet Americans eat called the SAD or standard American diet. Couldn't be better designed had it been designed by Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda to kill everybody here. In other words, it's a deadly diet we're eating. And so now we're talking talking about parents who are misinformed, eating a dangerous diet, and they're in charge of raising the next generation. And they don't have the knowledge about nutrition, or maybe they have the knowledge, but be, through the way they've eaten over the last you know, decades, they've become addicted to unhealthy foods. Their food preferences and food choices are based on, you know, foods that are, how should we say, highly palatable and they're and dangerous. And there's a lot of confusion with things that are popular and uh, there's food preferences and the people that write books and support people's desire to eat those foods, keep promoting those dangerous foods. So, so then your question is, well, how do we raise healthy children in this environment? Well, the first step is we have to walk the walk if we want to talk the talk. In other words, it means that if you don't model the diet you want your children to eat, there's no point in even ha having this discussion because it's only just a hypocrite. And children will never learn to eat healthy. And the medical studies also show that children only eat as well and eventually wind up eating the diet their parents eat. And they said they only eat, can, they only eat as well as their parents demonstrate that they eat and eventually they eat that way. So there's, there's some issues we can discuss on how to get children to eat healthy. But we have to frame that first with what is a healthy diet and what's so unhealthy about the way people are eating right now that's resulting in this explosion of cancer and heart attacks and dementia. And then before we discuss that, I just want to make clear that with this high rate of cancer and with the number one cause of death in children other than accidents being child, acute blastocytic leukemia, the number one cause of death in children. The question is that what I'm saying here is that the diet we eat young when we're young in life, in other words, diet that the child is exposed to prior to conception, during pregnancy, and the first 10 years of life has the largest impact of uh, um, on their future health and what are their disease outcomes they get later in life, whether they develop an autoimmune condition, whether they are allergies or asthmatic, whether they're more susceptible to infections, 
and what type of cancer and at what age they get cancer when they're an adult, the cancer that may kill them of breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer. One of the things that you were talking about before we jumped into this interview was that mothers are being recommended by a lot of people now to eat, what was it, folic acid mm -hmm. and, and how that's actually deleterious to their health and to their baby's health. Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, I just wanted to finish the point I was making that the diet you eat when the first 10 years of life has the biggest impact on what cancer you develop later on in life. Hmm. And we have to get kids eating healthier. The other thing is, is that it's not just the diet you eat in the first 10 years. It's also the diet eaten during pregnancy and the foods the mothers eat in the two years before conception. In other words, the foods the mother eats before she has a baby because her eggs of her children are living in her body. And those eggs can be negatively affected by her poor food choices, fast foods, processed foods, nitrates and processed meats, all these lack of you know, the lack of green vegetables, all these things can negatively affect their baby even before the baby's conceived. Now, your, your question is that um, about folic acid because the American diet is so low in folate because we can, because people in this country don't consume sufficient green vegetables, especially leafy greens and beans. And it's greens and beans that contain folate. And folic acid is the synthetic form of folate that's supplied from a petroleum by byproduct. It's not made from real food. There's no folic acid in food. Food contains folate. And the body has to take that folic acid you get from a supplement and convert it into folate to work the same fo as folate can. The point I'm making here is that there's a strong link between folic acid supplements and later life breast cancer and prostate cancer. In other words, folic acid supplements are a risk factor for cancer and our society advocates women take folic acid. You know, it's like we do the same thing with almost everything doctors do. Because people eat poorly, we give them cholesterol lowering drugs and blood pressure medications. We don't fix their diets. They don't have high cholesterol and high blood pressure. We don't make them eat a diet that's mostly, you know, that's nutrient rich and plant, you know, it's nutrient dense and plant rich. I call that diet a nutritarian diet that's designed to be essentially protective against heart attacks and strokes and cancers. Now, I know one of the things that you recommend is a pound of greens every day. Hearing you talk also brought up for me, at one point I was a raw vegan, raw foodist vegan. And one of the things that one of the people who I really followed was the 80-10-10 diet. And what he said is that you shouldn't have to take any supplements at all if you're eating a nutrient dense diet, such as a raw vegan diet. What do you think? Think about some of those statements and can you go into that pound of greens a little bit more? Yes, there are, there are a lot of irresponsible statements and I, I consider them almost to the point of being dangerous made by people in the food movement, you could say. And that's an example of irresponsible statements that can be dangerous to people if you listen to that kind of advice. For example, a per, it's just to keep bringing that up because you brought it up. A person on a raw food, vegan diet, 80, 10, 10, you don't take supplements. Well, that's utterly ridiculous. Those foods have no B vitamin B12 in it and people follow following that type of diet could become paralyzed or even killed by lack of B12. So also there's no, so we can go on and on there, but that's, let's not use that as a, as a focal point because that 80, 10, 10 is largely a fruit based diet. And the 10, 10 refers to 10% of calories from fat and 10% of calories from protein. And a lot of people can develop fat deficiencies and dementia and other difficulties in later in life from following that kind of program. So I'm not certainly recommending anything like that, but getting back to your question about a pound of green vegetables a day, to be specific, I'm saying that we should eat you know a big salad every day and with the tomato and the you know the other raw vegetables in there and like raw carrots or cabbage it could add up to a pound it could probably add up to a pound and then cook green vegetables you should really strive to eat a, um, a half a pound you know a day but the uh, the vegetables all together the green vegetables all together could add up to about a pound but I don't want to get people to get focused on this number of trying to get a pound I just it's a, it's a simple thing here I want people to recognize that raw green vegetables have the most powerful longevity promoting effects anti-cancer effects, let's, we should say, of any foods. And I have people t you know, stop what they're doing, get out a piece of paper and write, the salad is the main dish. And at least once a day, have a giant salad. And in that salad, you know, she'll put tomatoes and carrots and beans and peppers, but, but make sure you put some raw cruciferous vegetables in that salad. And the raw the cruciferous family is like watercress and arugula and cabbage and kale and bok choy. Put some raw cruciferous because the raw cruciferous have the most powerful anti-cancer longevity 
morning effects when you eat them raw. And put a little raw onion in there too, because the raw onion has tremendous benefits, especially when you eat it raw against cancer. So if we could get the whole population, to, you know, making a, a promise of big salary day. And then in addition to that, I do recommend people have a large, oversized portion of steamed greens like asparagus, artichokes, broccoli, zucchini, Brussels sprouts. You know, I want people to really make vegetables the center of their diet. And that's not all they're eating, of course. They eat nuts and seeds and beans and so and um, and other starchy and orange vegetables and yellow vegetables. But the point I'm making is whether you're a vegan or not, whether you can eat a little bit of animal products or no animal products, just being on a vegan diet doesn't make it healthy. You have to eat a lot of vegetables and you have to be healthy and prevent cancer and push the envelope of human longevity. The diet has to be vegetable based, not grain based not meat-based, not pasta and bread-based, not oil-based, not fruit-based, but it has to be vegetable-based. We have to eat a, a large amount of vegetables to push to really protect ourselves. And then we can discuss, well, if you're eating relatively healthy, you're eating a huge amount of vegetables, then what is it that you're still missing? And why would you need any supplements? What, what is there anything that could be low on a diet that's so nutritionally rich and nutritionally complete? And, and Dr. Joel, before, before we continue, can I ask, what if I'm a parent, I'm listening mm-hmm. to the show, and I'm getting excited about this new way of eating. And you've, you've already talked about to, to me about what seems to be common sense for most people is that vegetables, especially green vegetables happen to be the most nutritionally dense foods on the planet, as well as foods that are just the most preventative in regards to disease prevention and helping keep our families healthy and sustain life and longevity. What about as a parent, I get excited about this and then I start serving that salad and my kids just like, what? I don't want to eat this. And then I bring those green leafy vegetables that have been steamed and the kids like, I don't want to eat this. Have you found that if I start, if we were to start doing that regularly, that our kids eventually will go, well, I'll give that a try. And maybe their like or their taste buds will start to shift and they'll start to desire some of those foods. What can you say about that for parents? No, it usually doesn't work that way. I mean, in other words, if you take an animal like a monkey and you feed them, you know, they'll eat whatever you give them. But once you start giving them foods that are high color, caloric concentration that are intensely flavored, let's say, like then they'll choose those foods that are more calorically dense and highly flavored and sweetened and salted and concentrated, calorically concentrated like like white flour products, you know, they'll choose that over the eating natural foods. So you put a rat in a cage and they'll stop eating the vegetables and they'll start just eating the, the croissants and the donut and they won't even touch them and they'll eat themselves to death. And if you even give a, you can give it to them cocaine versus, um, and they can get a little injection of I intravenous cocaine which they'll do when they'll hit the speakers to get the cocaine, but they'll even take the donuts, the sugar, the fried, the oil, the caloric, sugary, highly concentrated foods. They'll choose that over the cocaine. The point I'm making is that you can't just give a child choices. They're going to choose the worst choice. You have to change the way the family eats. And that means you don't have those choices available in the home. The only way to get a child to eat healthy is to expose them to healthy food choices and not have the unhealthy choices in front of them. You know, so if you want to change over, you could say, well, we're we have a family meeting. We did this as a whole family. You know, we're not eating the external foods that most people eat, which is um, about, I should say that 55% of the American diet is highly refined and processed foods like salad, like donuts, cookies, crackers, rice cakes, breakfast bars, chips, you know, white bread and soft drinks. And, and that's like half, that's more than half the American diet. And about 30% is animal products. So we're talking about vegetation. You have to really have a choice of all types of vegetation in the house, but that's really much all you have, you know, that for dinner that day or the you have oats and and fruit and nuts. And the, the point I'm making is your house and your home has to be a protective environment of healthy foods so kids can freely eat what's available. They can't make the choices and open the refrigerator and say, oh, I'm going to eat the broccoli and I'm not going to eat the, you know, the pasta with the cream sauce, the fettuccine Alfredo. I'm going to eat the, I'm going to eat the burger with the melted cheese on it. I'm going to have the broccoli and the peas. They're not going to chew. They're not going to do that. You have to only have the broccoli and the peas and the pineapple and the oats with the flax seeds and the walnuts. You have to only have healthy food choices in your house. That's the only way to get kids to eat healthy. It's like I always say, shipwreck the family on Gilligan's Island. Is the only, you know, on Gilligan's Island, nobody's going to not eat healthy food. They're not going to starve themselves to death. And that's how I always tell people after a lot of years of study and scientific thought, I figured out that Skipper never really lived on that island. 
<laughs> you know, one thing that I like to get into here is you're talking about what we can eat, which is so awesome. And even just last night, I was sitting around the table with my family who eats really healthy. But, you know, my dad starts talking about, oh, you know, I'm so confused. You know, we used to be able to eat soy. Now we can't eat soy. And, you know, fat used to be good or it used to be bad. Now it's good. And so there's all these changes. And I think the point that you're really making is that vegetables, are, aren't changing. You know, vegetables are the common food that if you just eat whole foods that aren't processed and you're eating vegetables, it's a better choice. And the other thing that you're talking about, which is amazing, is if you take, if, if kids have a choice, they're always going to choose the unhealthy thing. And you can train taste buds. I mean, an example is my four-year-old nephew, he used to eat only avocados and fruits and vegetables. And now he's from a split home and so he goes to his dad's house he eats a bunch of junk food and now he's coming back and he doesn't want to eat any of the same foods he doesn't want to eat the avocados or the vegetables anymore so i think there's this this idea of being able to retrain the taste buds to to actually want and crave the foods that are good for us what do you think about that Oh, well, it's true. You like what you're used to eating. People from Thailand like Thai food. And in other words, you like whatever food you're eating. But the point is, is that we're in a toxic food environment. And what happens is that children get trained to like those dangerous foodstuffs. And of course, in most homes, parents are eating it too. You know, it's funny because I remember when my son was four years old, we took him to this elementary school where his sisters were performing in some kind of choir or something. And there was chocolate chip cookies being given out to every kid that walked in the door. And his nose of his face was at the same light of the table. And they handed him a chocolate chip cookie. And he never saw a chocolate chip cookie before. And he smelled it. And we were saying, what's he going to do? It's kind of interesting to watch. What does he does with it? So he took a little nibble of it and he went, ooh, that's junk food and threw it back on the table because it was too sweet for him. It was like he never tasted something that that was, you know, that was that artificially sweetened to that degree. And it was just too much for him. But the, I guess the point I'm making now is that, and you are making as well, we're in agreement on this, is that number one, we can make healthy ice creams and healthy pies and healthy all kinds of desserts. I can make a delicious tasting burger, you know, with mushroom and walnuts and beans. And I can, you know, in other, in other words, we could make all types of healthy food, taste delicious. And kids love this kind of stuff. But the parents have to really get, it's really a whole family effort. And we don't make up rules for the children that are not, that are different from the rules from the adults. So if the parents want to, everybody wants to go out and eat something that's not healthy once a week or something, the whole family has that right, but they should decide that as a family and they have the rules not to bring unhealthy food into the house or not to bring traditional desserts or ice cream in or only have it. But let me, so I think that all that's, um, all that's valuable, what you were bringing up and that we can learn to like healthy food and we have to transition people from the American diet onto this healthy diet. I remember when my child, when my, when my son was younger too, I used to come downstairs and I'd, he'd be eating kale with a cream sauce made out of soy, milk, and cash shoes and, you know, onion or something with on steam kale, cashew, on steam kale. And I'd say, get that kale away from that kid. He's eating too much green vegetables and I can't have him getting stronger than me. <laughs> <laughs> and then he'd eat some broccoli or kale and he'd come over and give me a push. And I'd, I'd stumble backwards and do a backflip over the couch and say, get those greens away from that kid. You know, <laughs> you make, uh, and, uh, you know, he's getting to, so he'd wake up in the morning, he'd be making muscles coming downstairs. Where's the broccoli, dad? I got to get stronger than dad. You know, so it's funny. We'd make a joke out of it. <laughs> That's a great way to encourage your kids too. Cause you know, little boys were, we're so into our muscles that if we associate and teach our kids that, Hey, certain foods are going to make you stronger and smarter and make a little fun game out of it. They're, they're going to want those foods. I'm really right. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, but you also, you know, actually enlist children to help their parents eat healthier because that's the key because pa children are, you know, they're not as addicted. They can make change easier. It's the parents that sabotage. When we're teaching children in schools how to eat healthy, the parents sabotage it. They object. They want to bring the junk into the school because they're the food addicts. They're the ones who are usually overweight and can't stop eating junk food and they're like sabotaging their children's future. But the other issue I wanted to make is that you brought up is that you made this comment earlier about confusion in the marketplace. And this study showing one thing and the soy and the fat. And I just want to clarify that because I don't think any of those things you said are true. Let me just say one thing is that along lay people in the lay press, a lot of things are magnified and distorted. But if we take what, the, what if we take a convention of nutritional scientists who are not commercially affiliated or not biased with commer strong commercial interests, not working for a food company or, a, you know, then we can see that 90 percent of all nutritional scientists in the world agree on three basic issues. Number one, that 
the American diet is, and the way the modern world is eating is way too low in vegetable of natural produce. We have to eat more fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds. So we have to eat more whole plant foods. That's number one. And we're all, there's no disagreement on that point. And number two, that processed foods and high glycemic carbohydrates like white flour products and sugar, refined sugars, create not just diabetes and heart attacks, but they also link to cancer in a very powerful relationship. So when you eat a bagel, when you eat a croissant, when you eat white bread, you are eating a strongly cancer-promoting food. I always say the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. You know, these are things that are powerfully dangerous, pizza and pasta. But And, and the number three is that we have to re- dramatically reduce the amount of animal products eaten because animal products promote via lots of different mechanisms, not only via saturated fat, but via their high protein, their the uh, other the high iron levels, the other, pro- the other um, bacteria that grow in response to eating those foods that we have to significantly reduce the amount of animal products Americans are eating, which are now over 30% of total caloric intake. And all healthy and long-lived societies eat 10% or less. So, And we know that there's a, about more than 100 different studies and some very um, excellent meta-analysis done over many years showing that people in higher consumption of animal products have a dramatic higher risk of cancer. In other words, a recent study showed a, a four-fold increase, that's a four times increased rate of cancer deaths when these people were followed for 20 years eating a higher amounts of animal products. So I should say that these things are are not controversial. They're clear. And the idea that you voiced earlier that studies show that you know saturated fat is good, not bad, that's not true. The studies didn't show that at all. They just showed that they just showed that when you substituted high saturated fat animal products and put high sugar, high glycemic carbohydrates, things didn't get better, they got worse. That doesn't absolve saturated fat of being dangerous. That just means that high glycemic carbohydrates are even more dangerous. So we're talking about two dangerous foods that everybody agrees are dangerous. So I just want to be clear that what people interpret from what you hear on the front page of Time Magazine and what you, you know, what people read and promote on the internet just confuses people. It's a shame they get confused by these, by these issues, you know? You know, one of the things that you talked about is enrolling children. But before I ask you a little bit about that, I want to say that I really appreciated that the whiter the bread the sooner you're dead. And one of my coaches, a wrestling coach that I worked with, he told me what he did with me is he helped me cut weight and be as lean and as strong as I could be, but also be very lightweight because it's essential for wrestlers. One of the things he said is he said, Luis, try to eat foods that have been handled by the minimum amount of people. So the more it takes for that food to get to you, and onto your plate, the less nutritionally dense it's, it is for you, which has always been a great rule of thumb for me when I'm trying to pick foods out. Now, going to those kids and children and enrolling kids, what are some ways that we can enroll our children with creating new health habits in our home? I, I also say the more you eat green, the more you get lean, too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's right. I mean, and what the point is, is that, you know, we have to do this as a family. I mean, you know, I know we're talking to parents here. And we want, you know, we know when we were growing up, a lot of us had our mothers smoked cigarettes, fathers might have smoked cigarettes because when they were kids, smoking didn't seem so bad and they got addicted and had a hard time quitting. And as adults, I mean, as children, we recognized that smoking was so bad and we were taught it in school and we helped, we helped our parents quit smoking. We played a role in them improving their health. And that's what we have to do today with regard to food because my parents were brought up and our part of middle aged and elder and people that are older and even people of childbearing age today are brought up in an environment where processed foods and fast foods were highly prevalent and they became addicted to these dangerous, highly addictive food substances that are, that are, that are destroying them. And we have now a population where that are, that are about more than 80% of people are overweight. So we're talking about a very unhealthy population and the rate of uh, medical care costs and the human tragedy that represents is astronomical from the way people are eating. So what we're saying here is that kids can recognize that our parents aren't always the model of best behavior and we have to enlist them. And even the parent can enlist their child. You have to help... You know, I have trouble staying away from these foods and I need you to watch what I eat. You know, they could say, Johnny, you know, I, I really want to help you to help me eat healthier. I'm making a pledge that mom and dad are, dad are going to eat healthier. I need your help to have us to help us stay on track because we haven't been taking as good a care of our health as we should be. In other words, if you want your child to be healthy and eat healthy, you have to, the parents have to look at yourself. If you want, you have to look at yourself first. You know what you say? Put on the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help others. Well, the parents have to clean up their act and they can enlist their child to help clean up the first business to tackle the children's child's doing what the child's eating the first step is to clean up your own act and enlist the child's help in helping you live healthier because that child loves you 
and wants you to be healthy and live a long life. And we have tremendous scientific information and support today for the facts are that you don't have to have heart attacks and strokes. You don't have to get demented and we can win the war on cancer. In other words, nutritional science has made dramatic advances in recent years and we're armed with the information to have a better, longer, higher quality of life. But we have to make a significant change and we have to enlist the younger generation to help that change stick. And that's the way to have them understand and reading this stuff together, learning, watching a video, learning nutritional information together and discussing it as a family and family meetings and how we're going to all try to help each other in a way that's not critical of one family or attacking a certain child eating unhealthily, but trying to put together a program that the whole family can adopt and can strive to emulate as a family unit. One thing I really want to drive home here is, you know, sometimes I'm around kids, I'm around my nieces and nephews. I see them eating the junk food. Their parents just look the other way. The parents are doing the same thing. And I, I keep wondering, what is it going to take to th- for them to be dri- driven the point home to really know that they need to make a change, that they need to get their kids off of these processed foods and off of the sugars? And I, I'd love to just hear from you a little bit more. What are the dangers? What is the real danger of feeding our kids the sugars and the processed foods and things like that? You know, isn't it amazing that we we love our kids so much? You know, we hold them in our arms when they're born. We look into their eyes. We put their seatbelts on. We brush them teeth at night. We tuck them in bed at night. We do everything we can to protect them. And yet we feed them the foods that guarantee they're going to get cancer when they get to a certain age as adults. And that cancer is caused by the foods the parents fed that kid. In other words, the parents have no idea that it's their choices of the foods they let their children eat, the foods they bring into the home that that when When the child is growing, when the cells are replicating, that's when the DNA of the cell unravels itself the widest. And that's when the greatest potential for DNA breaks and methylation and demethylation defects. That's when the groundwork is laid for cancer to develop. So when you get breast cancer at age 65, that's caused by mostly what your parents fed you or what you were eating in the first five and 10 years of your life and more of the first five than the first 10 even. And then when you see, because early puberty, going through puberty at age 10 or 11 or 12 is dangerous. And that's caused by what you ate and what you ate in the first five or six years of life determine when you went through puberty. You don't determine what, you know, so we're talking about, sure, I want people to eat healthy when they're older. It protects against dementia and heart disease and protects against cancer to a degree too. But the younger you are in life, the more powerful the healthy foods have a positive effect and the more powerful the unhealthy foods have a negative effect. And if parents knew the tremendous power what they were feeding their children had to pretty much draw the draw, draw the photo or you know draw the destiny of their children's health future. They would look at this as being essential. And I'm saying here that it's reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutrition. We've all be, got to become students of nutrition. This is not just for doctors and health professionals, because this is the most critical thing that affects our life and our happiness and our ability to concentrate in school and be successful in our careers and to be able to have a good marriage and well raise healthy children and not have tragedies in our lives. Is, is to, because we're in control control of our health only when we're in control of putting good quality food in our body. We are what we eat. It is true. We are what we eat. And I don't know how we got divorced from this, whereas the, pro- the processed foods and food promotions and cold cereals and fast foods and baked goods and, you know, that how this became the predominant way people th- live. And, uh, and it's just amazing how our country developed, how socially and economically, how that became the norm. And now we're fighting in a hole to get out of that because it's really just something that can't be sustained. You know, one of the key takes takeaways, which I want to recap for the audience is that if you're interested in being healthy, if you love your kids and you love yourself and your family, then it's going to be, and it is crucial to you and your family's health that you start implementing some very simple tips. And one of those tips has been eat lots more raw veggies, make a salad a day, one of your mottos, and try to go for a pound of greens every day and have some steam veggies. Really, that's kind of one of the key things. If we can simplify today's conversation, that's been one of the key takes away. Well, can now, I add something to that? Yeah, can I add something to that? yeah of course. 
Well, I use the term G-bombs to help people remember the foods they're supposed to be aiming to eat for every day. So the G-bomb stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. The seeds are like flax seeds, chia seeds, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds. And so I want people to eat make a big pot of soup on the weekends as a family, you know, with the vegetables, with beans in it, with mushrooms, and with onion, and all kinds of things. And you can have that, you can have it, you know, half the week. I want people to eat at least three to five fresh fruits a day. I want people to eat at least, you know, a half a cup of beans every day. I want people, so I like people to focus on greens, beans, have cooked vegetables, yes, and raw vegetables, yes, but also have some fresh fruit, particularly berries are powerful anti-cancer effects, and mushrooms have dramatic benefits, and seeds and nuts are, they should be a major fat source in your diet. So it's, it's a completely different way of looking at food to, to like understand these foods are the superfoods that have tremendous effects to, to mitigate your disease risks and to make yourself super healthy. This has been so amazing to have you on the show. We've been here with Dr. Joel Furman. So thank Thank you so much, Joel Furman, for being here. You're an amazing doctor, and this information can change lives once we implement it as families. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Thriving Launch Podcast. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure to head over to thrivinglaunch.com. We'll see you there. Be sure to tune into the next episode where we're going to talk about building confidence, building social confidence with Mike McApinlack. 